or the white tents no doubt being prepared in order to house the residents of Silwan once Israel's bulldozers move in on their homes. The most sublime act is to set another before you, the English poet William Blake once wrote. What's happening in Jerusalem, though, is the exact opposite of what Blake called for. What is being facilitated is a form of self-contemplation premised on and made possible by the removal of the other and the denial of his very existence. Indeed, a form of self-contemplation so cleansed of the traces of otherness that the particular comes to think of itself as universal, because the act of exclusion on which it is based is so extreme, is precisely what will be on offer within the Museum of Tolerance. The themes that Gary's design elaborates in visual terms externally, structurally, are, in other words, also to be addressed in textual terms in the museum's content. Let me give just a couple of quick examples of how this is to be played out in the museum's displays, which, according to its marketing literature, will take the tendencies already built into the LA Museum of Tolerance, the original one, to their ultimate extreme. The aim of the Jerusalem Institution is, we are told, to offer I'm quoting from the top paragraph there, a social laboratory that speaks to the world and confronts today's important issues, issues like global anti-Semitism, terrorism, and hate, a place that will remind us that greater than any external threat is the internal divide that separates us, a place that will reinforce the idea that Jewish unity is not a slogan but an essential recipe for survival in the 21st century. The remarkable thing here about the seamless, is the seamlessness of the move from universal statements about what might have seemed at first glance like matters of global concern to statements that make it clear that this is not an institution interested in the global and the universal after all, but rather an institution that by excluding the other reframes, reframes the, itself as universal. There's nobody left after all. Not hate in general is at stake, for example, the universal, but hatred of Jews specifically, the particular. The problem here is that the slippage from universal to particular is so subtle that one almost doesn't even notice it. And even after some consideration, it remains unclear who exactly is the us invoked in this thing. Are we everyone in the world? Or are we only Jews? For the passage that begins by addressing the world ends by invoking Jewish unity as though there were no difference between Jews and the world. If it is not already abundantly clear that the Museum of Tolerance in Jerusalem aims to recode the particular as the universal, the description of the institution's central and most important exhibit will surely drive that point home. A People's Journey. You probably can't read it, I'll read it for you. This experiential historical walkthrough, using the ship Exodus as a metaphor, dramatizes the seminal events and the pivotal moments in Jewish history. A people's journey takes the museum visitor on a voyage through the ages, an evocative environmental multimedia one and a half hour presentation of the golden age of Spain, the Spanish Inquisition, the Protestant Reformation, the Dreyfus trial, and Theodore Herzl's Zionist conference in Basel, immersing the visitor among heroes and amid layers of memory. The exhibit serves as a gateway connecting the past and serving as an introduction to the challenges confronting the modern state of Israel in the museum's second section, the social laboratory. That's all from their description. The point is that this is not simply a museum dedicated to Jewish history. There would be nothing wrong with that, of course, except for it being built on a Muslim cemetery. It is not even simply a museum dedicated to an attempt to rewrite the complexity and richness and vitality of Jewish history in unilinear teleological terms in, as Zionism. It is rather a museum that, having purged itself of the traces of the other, the Palestinian, seeks to represent a Zionist teleology in terms of universal values, to rewrite Zionism as a universal value. What is on display then is not Zionism as such, but Zionism as translated into the realm of value and recoded as tolerance. Otherwise, why not simply call it the Museum of Jewish History or the Museum of Zionism? Why call it the Museum of Tolerance? What is at stake here in the desire to package a museum about the particular Zionism in terms that so grandly evoke the universal tolerance? What is interesting about the deployment of the term tolerance here is not simply that Zionism is presented as the expression of tolerance, whereas resistance to Zionism is presented ipso facto as intolerance. 
It is also that the term tolerance itself is used as though it could be redefined as exclusive rather than inclusive. For the notion of otherness and the existence of an other are both built into the very concept of tolerance. I mean, tolerance doesn't mean self-tolerance. I, I don't tolerate myself, I tolerate you, the other. That's what tolerance means. It implies an engagement with some other. So it actually, it's literally meaning is to talk about self-tolerance in, in this way. So tolerance is, by definition, tolerance of the other, not of the self. This is clearly a museum founded by a Jewish institution that seeks to represent a certain version of Jewish history, framed in a particular way, obviously, for a Jewish audience, us. It is not about the other at all, it is about the self. More than that, it is a museum about a self constructed in a formerly other space from which the other has been removed and the last traces of otherness erased. Morally speaking, the museum makes a mockery of the usual understanding of tolerance. It is best, however, to understand this process not simply in moral terms as an act of hypocrisy or grotesque self-satisfaction. That may be in part what it is, but there's much more at stake in the project as well, both symbolically and politically speaking. What is at stake is the play of the universal and the particular, which are essential to the discourse of tolerance in the first place, but here, again, are altered and reframed, though in profoundly and, I think, unconsciously telling ways. For one thing, as with everything connected to this project, the act of exclusion and the erasure of the Palestinian other is so clean, so pure, so total, that it is no longer recognizable as such. In fact, it is an act of erasure that, far more successfully than Independence Park or the wall, erases itself in turn. When the museum's backers and initiators, above all Rabbi Heyer, say that they don't see anything wrong with building a museum of tolerance and a center of human dignity on a dispossessed people's graveyard, or that, as he says, moderation and reason have prevailed when people are prevented from visiting their relatives' graves, or that Zionism is also, as he says, a force of tolerance, they must be seen to be absolutely sincere, convinced of their own deep morality. This is not just an act of hypocrisy, in other words, which is exactly why we need to go beyond a moralistic approach in trying to understand and analyze it. What is being expressed here is a kind of genuine blindness, an inability to understand or even to recognize the other. We can think of it as a kind of racism, not the kind that one encounters, say, in Avigdor Lieberman, who came to Israel as a 20-year-old Moldovan Jewish immigrant and now as an immigrant wants to expel the remnant of the indigenous Palestinian population not successfully cleansed from their homes in 1948. They have no place here, Lieberman said of the country's Palestinians. They can take their bundles and get lost. Lieberman's kind of racism is blunt, but it is also honest. It acknowledges the existence of the other, and it says frankly that it seeks to remove the other. The point is that the violence that it directs against the other is premised, ultimately, on an acknowledgement of the other's existence and the threat of the other's existence and its sense of home to the Zionist project to create an exclusively Jewish home in Palestine. This other kind of racism, by contrast, the one that the Museum of Tolerance expresses so perfectly, is much more complicated. Its premise is not simply denial of the other or erasure of the other, but rather, as I've been saying all along, the denial of denial, the erasure of erasure. This is a form of denial that produces the inability, the absolutely sincere, honest incapacity to acknowledge that a denial and an erasure have taken place because that denial, that erasure, have themselves been erased and purged from consciousness. This is a form of Zionist consciousness that has been built on the premise of the denial of denial, a form of consciousness blissfully unaware of the forms of denial of denial on which it is based. This is why so often, I think, even the most principled criticisms of Israeli policy are received with the eruptions of blind rage that cloud discussions of the Zionist conflict with the Palestinians in the US and elsewhere. When that which has been so far and so long denied and repressed is forced back into the consciousness that has denied it, the reaction is sheer fury rather than intelligent and articulate counter-argument of which there is such a paucity in contemporary Zionism. In discovering this psychic formation, this sense of, this worldview, this sense of being, really, we have, as I suggested earlier, arrived at another kind of Zionism from the one represented by Lieberman. 
This is the form of contemporary Zionism, the dominant one in the US and elsewhere as well probably, that is founded on the repression or the denial of the knowledge of the ethnic cleansing of Palestine in 1948. 